So you have Kali Linux up and running. You know how to install, update, and remove software packages, and hopefully you've learned a few basic Linux commands along the way. So how do we begin to set up and use Kali for doing digital forensics work? Well, let's start by looking at the default Kali GUI environment. When you are looking for something to learn about Kali, you won't be bored if you start poking around in the top-level applications menu. Many of Kali's significant utilities and tools are found in the application submenus. The Kali Linux submenu is where we find the tools that Kali is famous for. Remember what I said about the Kali Meta packages in the Tools installation demo? This is the menu group where they are added. This Pluralsight course focuses on the tools in the Forensic Hashing Tools and Forensic Imaging Tools submenu groups. Other Pluralsight courses will detail Forensics tools in several of the other submenu groups. I must admit that I do not use Kali's GUI menus very much. I run everything from the command line, including starting GUI applications. When you start a command line program from the GUI menu, all it does is open a command window for you anyway so I prefer to already be in a command window. There are also many tools that are not found in Kali's GUI menus, so one way or another you'll have to become competent with using the Linux command line. What you need in a forensics workstation depends on what you want to do with it. A forensics lab generally contains three types of forensics computers. Forensic examination stations, both fixed and mobile, research stations, and report writing stations. Let's have a detailed look at the requirements of each. Forensic examination stations are used to acquire, image, backup, and analyze items of evidence and also to prepare work media used in the examination procedure. Examination stations can be desktop, tower, or laptop computers with directly installed operating systems on disk, a guest operating system running in a virtual machine, or both. Examination stations are air-gapped meaning they are never connected to an external network, such as your organization's business network or to the public internet. The idea is to provide due care in preventing the evidence attached to an examination station from becoming contaminated by other information or from software activity. Examination stations are recycled after each forensic examination. Either their hard drive is re-imaged or the virtual machine is reloaded from its base snapshot. When you need to update the tools and operating systems of an examination station, it is the disk or VM image that is updated and loaded onto the examination station computer. Research stations are used to connect internal and external tools and information repositories needed to conduct a forensic examination. Research stations will contain samples of evidence, such as documents, images, and malware samples, and should be isolated from your business network given no inbound access from other networks and granted only restricted access to the Internet. Any evidence information placed in a research station should be stored in a sandboxed environment that is purged when the information is no longer needed. Research stations should not have installed software that may be unintentionally altered evidence, such as antivirus software. And it is a good idea to have a policy to periodically update and clean research stations by re-imaging them, too. A report writing station is another name for your work computer in your office. It is connected to your business network and to the internet and it is where you do your forensic report writing and other official communications. The security and operational standards for the report writing station are determined by your organization's IT department policies. Of these three workstations, you will want several examination stations running Kali, and maybe have Kali running on several research systems too. Unless you work in a really cool organization, your IT department won't have standardized on Kali for its business systems. If you find that you need Kali for your forensics work, a forensic examination laptop for field work running Kali should be part of your field kit. But why use Linux? You already have Windows and OS X forensic workstations and some cool hardware for pulling information off of cell phones and media storage devices, so why have Kali Linux boxes too? Besides having tools for analyzing evidence that you won't find in a Windows environment, Kali is also great for creating forensically sterile media, duplicating evidence devices, and making work copy devices. Also consider that Linux tends to be very impartial when it comes to the hardware and software technology of other vendors. 
The Linux community has written a great deal of tools and drivers allowing the file systems and devices of many manufacturers to be used by the Linux environment. If you find a device that your Windows and OS X software can't figure out, the Linux community may have a solution for you. So far I've talked about ways to run Kali, but what should you run Kali on? Hardware-wise, I mean. You can run Kali on almost any type of laptop, desktop, tower for a forensic workstation with high-performance, high-reliability computers from any major manufacturer being preferred. I would suggest using a laptop computer with a docking station and external monitors, keyboard, and mouse as your choice for workstations. This gives you not only a portable desktop computer, but also relieves the need of buying UPSs for those occasional power glitches. Speaking of power, buy some extra battery packs and power adapters too. If you are concerned about people easily walking off of laptops from your lab, there are plenty of high-grade locking systems to deter would-be perpetrators. In my opinion, for a mobile forensic laptop, you will have a hard time finding anything better than a 15-inch Apple MacBook Pro. The MacBook Pro is a very reliable and high-performance machine that can run Mac OS X, Windows, and Linux all simultaneously using virtual machines. Between the 13, 15, and 17-inch screen sizes, the 15-inch seems to be the most usable for in-the-field forensics, and the 17-inch is great for a lab-only workstation. I would also recommend getting the most RAM and flash storage that you can. Hey, those VMs get big. You also need all of those Thunderbolt cables, including a Thunderbolt to USB 3.0 and eSATA adapter. Yes, Apple stuff is pricey, but when you start shopping, check the refurbished units in the Apple store first. Regardless of the computer manufacturer that you pick, there is a significant list of other equipment you will find useful for your forensic workstation. Docking stations for attaching media drives to your forensic examination station. External optical disk readers that handle a variety of CD and DVD formats. Memory card readers for different storage card formats. Cables and adapters for attaching external devices to your forensic examination station. Hardware write blockers for forensic examination of external storage devices. Powered hubs for connecting USB devices to your workstation and creating an ad hoc Ethernet local area network when examining multiple network systems. And finally, you can never have too much spare power, standby power, and power conditioning. It's easy to think of the types of modern storage devices you will typically see brought into your forensics lab, but what about the occasional device that was common years ago but is now old and obsolete? You just never know what someone will drop onto your workbench to be examined for information. Legacy information storage media you may still run across include hard drives, floppy disks, magnetic tapes, media storage cards, magnetic stripe cards, and audio cassettes. Remember when answering machines used those? You may consider many of these information storage formats not worth supporting. I mean, 8-inch floppy disks? Really? Where are you going to get a drive to read one of those? But suppose if you have a business that offers a data recovery service, and you are the only place in town that can recover data, on the spot, from that legacy technology. What is that service worth to a customer in need? My advice? Never throw away old hardware or old software. Keep what you have in running order and collect what you don't have. You never know when it may become useful again. For more ideas of legacy media to support, I recommend the website Museum of Obsolete Media. YouTube is also a great place for finding people demoing old equipment. And it's amazing how much of this old stuff is available for sale on eBay. There are a lot of specialty hardware devices and software utilities that make digital forensic examination tasks more automated and thorough to ensure more success at information discovery and recovery. Hardware disk duplication and wiping can be performed using a standalone duplication station. Just plug in the evidence hard drive and one or more work copy hard drives and start it up. The work copy drives are forensically sterilized and an exact verified copy of the evidence drive is imaged on them. This is not only convenient, but fast, can be performed out in the field, and it doesn't tie up a computer workstation either. Popular hardware disk duplicators are available from Intelligent Computer Solutions and Tableau. 
Software disk duplication is performed using special software running on a forensic examination workstation. The source device to copy and the target device to image are usually connected via USB or eSATA interfaces. Kali does come with several disk cloning tools. Other software disk duplicators are FTK Imager from Access Data and Tableau Imager. Disk wiping and sterilization software includes the well-known and free Derek's Boot and Nuke and the commercial data erasure solutions from Blanco. Write blockers are necessary to prevent original evidence devices from being written to and corrupted during imaging and examination. Hardware write blockers are placed between the storage device being read and the computer doing the reading. The result is that no information or write commands can reach the write block storage device. There are quite a few choices of hardware write blockers, including those from EPOS, Tableau, and WeebyTech. Software write blockers run on the computer accessing the storage device. Their primary advantage is lower costs than their hardware counterparts and verification that the storage device is actually write protected. EPOS Write Protector and the open source Linux Write Blocker project on GitHub are two tools to try. And yes, you can use both hardware and software write blocking at the same time. Have you ever come across media that wouldn't read because of bad sectors or physical damage? Maybe you get some information from the media, but how do you know that's all that you can get? Fortunately, there are both hardware and software tools for recovering data from damaged media and possibly repair the media too. Hardware tools include the EPOS Bad Drive Adapter that recovers bad sectors as you image the media, and the Optical Disk Reviver from Silicon Forensics that actually recovers data from damaged, erased, partially overwritten, and unfinalized CDs and DVDs. How cool is that? You have two great choices for data recovery and media repair software tools in SpinWrite from Gibson Research and Disk Recoup from QTech. Before I finish up this module, and you start buying a bunch of hardware and software for your lab, let me familiarize you with the concept of forensic soundness. A definition of forensically sound is acquiring electronic information in a manner that ensures it is as originally discovered and is reliable enough to be admitted into evidence. This means that original evidence must be unaltered from how it was discovered, and copies of original evidence, that is, work copies, are to exactly match the original evidence. If we apply the concept of forensic soundness to our forensics tools and methods, the definition might change like this. Tools and procedures known and verified to acquire electronic information in a manner that ensures the information is as originally discovered and is reliable enough to be admitted into evidence. We can see that the forensic soundness of evidence is not only shown by testing the evidence, but also by the use of proven and accepted tools and methods for collecting and analyzing the evidence. We also need to acknowledge the possibility that the operation of forensic collection tools may introduce new information into the collected digital evidence, and that to maintain forensic soundness, the changes made must be plainly discernible from the original evidence. As a forensic examiner who may be submitting his or her analysis of digital information as evidence in a court of law, it is very important to use tools that are well known and well accepted to the digital forensics community, and accepted in prior court cases, for ensuring the acceptance of evidence submitted to the court. As I said, your tool should be forensically sound for your evidence to be forensically sound. It sure would be nice to have an official listing of software and hardware tools that are known to be forensically sound. Even for IT guys that will likely never see the inside of a courtroom, it would be good to know what are the most trusted digital forensics tools. The Computer Forensics Tools Testing Project at the National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST, is an ongoing project to test computer forensic software tools using standardized test procedures and criteria for understanding a tool's capabilities and to verify that the tool consistently produces accurate and objective test results using repeatable test cases. The new and legacy CFTT websites detailing the testing of many hardware and software tools are available at these links. The CFTT also publishes a Computer Forensics Tool Testing Handbook containing evaluations by NIST of forensic hardware and software products available at this link. I discussed using Kali Linux as a forensic workstation and the three different types of workstations you might find in any forensics lab. 
I also detailed how these forensic workstations are configured, some best practices for their use, and what types of computer hardware they might use. I also made suggestions for the types of equipment you might find handy to have in your forensics lab and what types of media you might need to extract information from.